Here. Commissioner Crawford. Here. Commissioner Hess. Here. Commissioner Stupka. We have a quorum. So we will now move into the oath of office. There are a couple um, of commissioners who have been reappointed and one new commissioner appointed during the time since we have not been meeting in person. So in place of being able to sign their oath of office card uh, in person, we will uh, go through a verbal acknowledgement. So Commissioner Hachimaki, Commissioner Parsons, and Commissioner Kleinman, I'll ask you to please read through the oath of office when I can get it back to the... All right, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Kleinman and do it this way, because that's what has come up. So Commissioner Kleinman, if you could read through... Sorry, I was, I was muted, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, I, Molly Kleinman, solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of this state, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Transportation Commissioner of the City of Ann Arbor, Michigan, according to the best of my ability. This oath is valid for the entirety of my term through May 31st, 2023. Okay, thank you, Molly. I'm gonna try to get us back to the rest of the commissioners. Okay. Just one moment. I'm sorry. I have an apple. Oh. Okay, Commissioner Hatamaki, if you could read your own box. Okay. I automatically solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the state, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Transportation Commissioner of the City of Ann Arbor, Michigan, according to the best of my ability. This oath is valid for the entirety of my term through May 31st, 2022. Thank you. And Bradley, we'll find yours. There you go, Bradley. <laughs> uh, I, Bradley Parsons, solemnly swear to, uh, or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of this state, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Transportation Commissioner of the City of Ann Arbor, Michigan, according to the best of my ability. This this oath is valid for the entirety of my term through May 31st, 2023. Thank you, Bradley. So one other um, housekeeping item related to roll call, I wanted to announce that Brian Smith is now on the call. He's with us from the Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority. And Matt Carpenter, who is currently the commission representative, is, uh, as I understand, intending to delegate that role and appoint Brian Smith as a, an alternate representative for AATA. And that is um, planned to be considered by the board at tomorrow's meeting. Is that correct, Brian? That's correct. Okay, and if you could just uh, say a sentence or two about yourself um, as our prospective commissioner joining us uh, officially in July, but here informally. Certainly, uh, my name is Brian Smith. I'm the deputy CEO in charge of operations for the ride. I've been in transit now for 26 years. I uh, always have to remember what that is. Um, started as a bus driver at Kent State University and have worked at a ver variety of jobs uh, in Ohio, Illinois, and now in Michigan. Um, and look forward to being a, a member of the commission um, and learning more about what, what you all cover and and I appreciate sending the study guide ahead of time. Great. Thank you, Brian. And that completes our roll call and I think it's over to you, Molly. Okay, great. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, so before I move on to the approval of the consent agenda, I just want to begin our meeting by taking a moment to honor the memory of black people who were the victims of white supremacist violence and who should still be with us today. George Floyd and Aura Rosser, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and too many more, their lives mattered. Black lives matter. 
Across the country, at protests where people are demanding justice, we hear a familiar chant. Whose streets? Our streets. Here on the Transportation Commission, our mission is to help make Ann Arbor streets safe for all users. But so often when we say all, we're talking about modes of use, walking, biking, transit, and so on. We have a special responsibility to take care that when we say safe streets, we mean safe for black people, safe for queer and trans people, safe for immigrants, safe for unhoused people and people living with mental illness. I am recommitting myself right now to do the work of the commission with an orientation towards justice and inclusion. Um, I'm gonna share some words from The Untokening, which is a multiracial collective that centers the lived experiences of marginalized communities to address mobility, justice, and equity. They write, our communities look and function the way they do because of intentional harm perpetrated by white supremacist policies and actions by government and advocacy. Historical disenfranchisement, disinvestment, disproportionate exposure to pollution, and repressive policing in communities of color continue to negatively impact our collective health, wealth, mobility, and security. Mobility justice demands that we fully excavate, recognize, and, recon and reconcile the historical and current injustices experienced by communities, with impacted communities given space and resources to envision and implement planning models and political advocacy on streets and mobility that actively work to address historical and current injustices. All right, thanks. So now we're gonna move on to the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any modifications to the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Uh, Parsons? And anyone second it? Hadamaki? Um, great, so we have to do a roll call for all of our votes. Is that right, Kayla? I don't believe that's required. Oh, that's, that's not true. Not, I don't think that okay. applies for our commission, not that I've been told by the clerk's office. Okay, great. So then all those in favor, please raise your hand. No, it'll work out. Right. Great, all those opposed, raise your hand. Okay, uh, the agenda is approved. Um, Tim, it, does Commissioner Hull, are you opposed to the approval of the consent agenda? Or was that just the hand raise was left over? I just, uh, I rose my hand when you said uh, in favor and I hit the raise hand oh. button. I wasn't oh. sure what you wanted me to do. And then I- Sorry about that. After we were done. Okay, sorry about that. I just happened to see it as um, we were wrapping up the opposing the agenda. Okay, okay. so we're all set, thank you. Great. So now we're gonna move on to public comment. Uh, this is an opportunity for people to speak for up to three minutes. Please call 1-888-788-0099. And wait, yeah, I got that right, sorry. And enter meeting ID 955-6177-1183. Uh, this information should also be displayed on your screen if you're watching. Uh, city staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to raise your hand to indicate your desire to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement that the host is allowing you to speak. Um, when speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds so that we may hear you clearly. Um, state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Do we have anyone on the line for public comment? We do not. Okay, I'll give it a few seconds in case someone is trying to call in. Um, if, it, if it's friendly with everybody else, um, because that takes a, a time to dial in and go through those hoops, if, if we could just agree to field calls uh, in between agenda items, I'd be more than happy. Um, and that way we could move forward if we want. All right, that's, I will accept that. Are there are any objections to that? Okay. Um, great, so we'll just move on and as, if we get any calls, we'll, we will take them as they come. Um, so we're now on to information and discussion and we are inviting Systems Planning Chief of Staff, uh, Marty Prashan, to present the fiscal year 21 transportation budget. Thank you. Um, as mentioned, my name is Marty Prashan. I'm the Chief of Staff of the Public Services area. 
and I'm pleased to be here this evening to have the opportunity to discuss with you the highlights of the fiscal year 21 approved budget. I'll be sharing the highlights of that budget along with some additional updates on progressing projects and initiatives. Slide. The fiscal year 21 overall budget is in excess of $465 million. As you can see, there's a breakdown of the funds that make up that budget. The largest amount obviously is the other categories, but a significant part of that budget is the enterprise funds, which means um, really water, sewer, storm, solid waste funds, funds of that nature that are actually separate businesses. Um, all the city fund balances re remain within the city policy goals. Uh, the general fund is uh, at 17.9%, I believe is what that is supposed to say. Sorry about that. Um, our fund balances that typically fund transportation items um, would be our street millage, our street sidewalk and bridge millage, which requires a 50% annual, re uh, annual revenue reserve or about $4.7 million and our weight and gas tax funds, which require one year of annual revenues. So that's about $15 million between the major and local street funds. And our enterprise funds require 25% of operating expenses, and we exceed uh, those in all of our enterprise funds currently. Uh, we also have um, very good bond ratings. Our general obligation bond rating is a double A plus. We also have that same rating in our sanitary sewer fund. And our water fund uh, comes in at a double A rating. Uh, the budget proposed for this year and passed by city council included increases that amounted to about $7 annually in property taxes. And what was presented to council was an overall 7.5% utility cost increase. However, um, not all of the rates were passed at, at the inception of the budget. So we are looking at about a 5% overall increase in the utility rates paid by our customers. Slide. As you um, are aware, I'm sure, uh, with the onset of COVID-19, there are some financial impacts to the city. Um, some of those uh, are represented here on the slide. Um, I should indicate to you that basically when we were forecasting uh, this information, it was basically the worst case scenario. So in the weight and gas tax, we assumed that uh, traffic would not open back up. So we're hoping that um, we won't actually see this much of a deficit in our revenue collection. However, uh, we wanted to be able to plan for the worst case scenarios in all of these um, areas. Um, for utilities, um, we had anticipated that U of M would not be returning to class in the fall. So again, this is a, a pessimistic look at the revenues. And in the end, we uh, hope that those things won't come to fruition. Um, you can obviously assume that the parking revenues from the DBA will be down as well as parking fines, fire inspections. Uh, we weren't able to enter businesses or homes and the parks programs were, were shut down. Therefore, their revenue is projected to be further down and then also the state revenue share that the city gets would also, also be projected to be down about 3% in fiscal year 20 and 20% in fiscal year 21. Next slide. As we move forward in the budget process, um, included annually in the annual budget process is the preparation of performance measures, which are intended to reflect the strategic and community goals. Um, each unit comes up with their internal measures and metrics to be included as part of the budget. Those uh, you will find in the budget document. Um, these also are reviewed quarterly with meetings with the city administrator and finance staff. And you can also find uh, what we refer to as KPIs or key performance indicators, uh, which really gives you statistical information and some examples of that are on the right hand side of the slide. Um, you can see some police department statistics there that um, folks find interesting. Uh, for transportation um, items and public service items, you'll find statistics related to pedestrian accidents, um, miles of sidewalk, the um, rating system of our roads, and um, pothole uh, 
uh, corrections and fills and the sweeping information regarding to bike lanes. Slide. Street resurfacing repair is a major initiative of the public services area for which we have established strategic goals and performance measures. Um, as you can see by the information reflected on the slide, uh, street resurfacing and repair is funded mostly by our street bridge and sidewalk millage with an annual revenue amount of about $13 million. In addition, this particular budget includes about just under $350,000 from the county millage rebate and is also supplemented by Act 51 or weight and gas tax funding, about $3 million from the major, major and local street funds. Um, again, the strategic goal regarding uh, the roads is that 80% of our pavement is in good condition by 2025. Slide. Uh, this slide uh, is indicating what the plans for road treatments are this construction season. And uh, there was some conversation at the beginning of the meeting regards to this. Um, the plans this year call for 10 miles of resurfacing and rehab and about nine miles of capital preventative maintenance, both on major and local streets. The map indicated to the right will show you the streets that will be receiving resurfacing in blue, and then the capital maintenance, which includes uh, like surface treatments such as crack seal and cape seal, those type of things in accordance with our asset management plan. Beginning this construction season, our surface treatment program has a project budget of about $3.6 million. And then also with street resurfacing has a budget of over $10.5 million. Um, and those again will cover both major and local streets. Um, in addition, Act 51 kicks in some funding for surface treatment, about $2 million for major streets and 750,000 or so of local street money. The streets that are selected are chosen by our asset management plan and, and um, are worked into existing projects. So if we are entering an area to resurface the road, we will consider the utilities that are underground. Therefore, impacts to utility rights and uh, COVID impacts may end up eventually changing Nick's plan for his uh, surface treatment or capital preventative maintenance. Slide. Uh, another focus of our uh, fiscal year 21 is uh, pedestrian safety. Um, this would include such things as uh, lighting improvements, crosswalk upgrades, um, signs in school zones and signalizations and the RRFB indicators. Um, this budget includes about $470,000 from the county millage rebate, which uh, we'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, however, in addition, we have approximately 1.7 of sidewalk gap funding and path upgrades and maintenance included in the street bridge and sidewalk millage. Slide. This map may look familiar to you. This is the updated map that indicates all of our major street uncontrolled cross rock street light needs. Um, the, the legend is on the bottom that indicates the prioritization in, the, in what is completed and what is in process on the lower part of the map. Um, the funding for the, the millage includes 135 to address these crosswalks. I think we are now in our third year of that process. We have 105 for uh, existing streetlight replacements, which is in, in accordance with our asset management plan for replacement of existing fixtures as well as the pools. And then we also have an additional $230,000 for pedestrian crossing and school zone safety improvements. In addition uh, to assist in um, pedestrian improvements, um, we have a pavement bar marking budget of approximately $650,000. This year's plan uh, beginning this construction season will address 41 miles of long line remarking. So this is maintenance 
12 miles of bike lane remarking and 330 intersections will be touched this year with the pavement marking contract. Slide. Finally, some other items of interest that I am sure that you are well aware. Um, staff continues to uh, work with the commission as well as city council in regards to healthy streets. Those items were not specifically budgeted. However, to this point, um, the operating budgets have been able to um, cover the cost of those items. This year's budget also includes $100,000 for the resident driven sidewalk app program. Uh, also funded was staff time associated with the continuation of the tree line trail project. Um, we are currently in the process of completing a tree alignment study that will help us do some preliminary engineering for an important pedestrian connection from the border to border trail near Argo to the city property at 721 North Main. That project is ongoing and is funded. And in addition, we have the Allen Creek Berm opening project, um, which also installed another important pedestrian uh, connection uh, through the railroad property there. Um, I've in included a link here that will give you a, a time lapse video of the installation of the culprit in that project that is quite interesting. So you might want to take a look at that. The Allen Creek Berm project is about a $9 million project. About $4 million comes from the city's fund between the stormwater fund and the alternative transportation fund. And then the rest were grant dollars through MDOT, Watts, FEMA, and the DNR. So um, it's quite a project and it, folks are very excited about it. And um, if you're interested, you should take a look at the video. It's, it's very interesting. Slide. And that's about all I had. I know Kayla said that you had a very full agenda this evening, so I wanted to keep it short. If, um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to attempt to answer them. And if I can't, I will certainly get back to you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to keep an eye out for raised hands. And I see Julie has a question. Thank you. Um, so I was just curious how we're doing on the 2025 uh, pavement or uh, road improvement goal. Could you say something about what sort of progress we've made so far? Actually, I think probably Nick is better suited to answer that, Nick, if you're available. Yeah, I'm available. Okay. Um, we are, uh, we're monitoring it. Uh, we're doing, we're collecting data every other year on our pavement condition. Um, it's uh, um, so we we don't always have fresh as you know at up to the moment data, um, but uh, from the data we collected last year, um, we're still struggling a little bit with the data. Um, we're definitely um, you know it's a challenging goal, a very challenging goal to meet, um, and so we're not exactly where we would like to be at the moment. Um, but uh, the data that we are getting back is helping to direct our efforts going forward as well um, in terms of moving um, some of our focus between major streets, local streets, and whatnot. So um, not exactly where we want to be right now, but uh, um, you know, you know we're, we're redirecting to try to um, get as close to that goal as we possibly can. Sure. So, so given that, how did you come up or how did, maybe this is for Marty again, how did you come up with the amount that's dedicated to to roads? It looks like it's about three percent of the overall budget. Is that right? Um, how we came up with the amounts is basically a prioritization schedule. When we go through the capital improvements plan, all the projects in that plan are all prioritized, and that's how we end up where we are. Yeah, I just wonder if we need to be putting more money in to reach that goal? Um, well, that's a topic for conversation. However, um, in, in that case, the whole prioritization scheme actually addresses that issue. So if you were to put more funding there, something else would have to yeah. be put by the wayside. Thank you. Tom, you're on mute. Um, yes, Commissioner Parsons. 
I, I can wait on Tom if he wants to chime in. Um, uh, okay, great. I'm sorry, I was trying to raise that electronic hand. Um, uh, if I could add to that, when you talk about the total funding that's available, this, the, the, it's actually, uh, I, I would describe the total funding available by the sources of funds that we have. So the millage only aggregates so much. We're able to supplement that to some with applications for grants and things like that. But as far as pulling from other funds, um, all, uh, most of the city's dollars are uh, restricted by the source of the funding that they get. The exception would be the general fund, which is uh, one of the larger funds. So in order to get additional funds for uh, transportation, you would typically typically either uh, uh, seek additional funds or pull it from the uh, general fund, which uh, has a lot of priorities, uh, has a lot of operating priorities there. So that, that's, that's the challenge in increasing funds. Hello. Okay, so we're gonna do Commissioner Parsons and then Council Member Griswold. Uh, I, I, I feel like every time we talk about the budget when it comes to transportation, uh, I wanna remind this body and everybody watching from home uh, that, that Act 51 funds, the fuel tax, uh, is a very small portion that goes toward road maintenance and construction, something like 7%. And I think I heard those numbers roughly you know, I'd have to do the math, but maybe others can chime in and, and uh, you know, uh, confirm that. Uh, but when we talk about Ann Arbor streets and the funds that maintain and build them, we're really talking about property tax uh, through millages, either through the city or for, through the county. And, and so uh, I, I just like to remind everyone that, you know, that's where the funds are from. You know, it can impact how you feel about how we build things, but that's really where the money's coming from. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Griswold. Uh, yes, thank you. And I just want to uh, mention that I'm using my phone because the audio on my computer is not working right now. Um, I had two questions. The first one is we talk about lines painted on the road. Uh, what about the stop bars at crosswalks and at intersections? Are they included in those uh, lines or is that a separate fund? They are included, yes. They are, oh, okay, thanks. Uh, and, and just for the record, uh, I, I wanna say that I, do not agree with prioritizing lighting at, at crosswalks. I don't think we should have any crosswalks without lighting. And I have asked for clarification about whether an unlit crosswalk is safer than no crosswalk, especially at the mid-block level. So that's something that council has taken up. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? I'm going to look for the raised hands in the sidebar. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. So uh, thank you so much uh, to Ms. Prashan. And I think we're ready to move on to our next uh, item. So now we're going to invite city engineer Nicholas Hutchinson to provide an update on street, bridge, and sidewalk millages. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your time this evening. Um, as mentioned, I, my name is Nick Hutchinson. I'm the city engineer for the city of Ann Arbor. Um, and I'm here this evening to talk about the street bridge and sidewalk millage, which was just mentioned a moment ago, and also a new millage for the construction of new sidewalks. And uh, a lot of the information that I'm presenting to you this evening is going to be shared with the uh, city council in the form of a memo. Um, and uh, and and I'm we're sharing that with you this evening because we want to get your comments and feedback to incorporate into that memo as well um, before we send it to City Council um, probably in early July here. So go ahead and change the slide. Did everybody see my slide presentation? Not yet, and Kayla, you're still muted. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> I, th I think Kayla's bringing it up here. Sorry, all working on it. It's very difficult with one monitor to, um, I can't get back to unmute myself when I'm trying to pull it up. Um, and I've got it now. 
seems to be having some trouble with the um, PDFs today, but I think we're good to go now. All right, you can go to the second slide. All right. Oh, um, so first of all, a little bit of background in terms of the uh, the street what's called what is now called the street bridge and sidewalk millage. Um, historically, this has been a five year millage. It's been around since the early '80s. Um, and as Commissioner Parsons mentioned, mentioned this is the single biggest source of revenue for our for our streets. Um, <clears throat> in 2011, the that that street millage was expanded to include sidewalk repairs. Um, and in, as I mentioned, it's now called the street bridge and sidewalk millage. Um, we are um, gonna be proposing for the November ballot this year, uh, two millages. There's going to be that millage, which is essentially gonna be the same millage as was on the ballot back in 2016. Uh, but there's also gonna be a new millage proposed for the construction of, or filling, side, filling the filling of sidewalk gaps um, in the city sidewalk system. Sorry, I'm just gonna jump in really quickly. I'm not seeing the slides, or is everyone else seeing the slides? Or, okay, so then it's my problem. I'll figure it out. Sorry, continue. Okay, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, so the, uh, as I mentioned, both of these are going to be separate ballot items on the November 2020 ballot. Um, and as if you were, if you were noting, I mentioned that it's a five-year millage. It was last on the ballot in 2016. So in theory, we should be bringing this back in 2021, um, but because we don't have odd year elections anymore in Ann Arbor, um, we are opting to bring it, put it on the ballot in 2020 um, and uh, um, and have it start a year later when the one expires. Um, that way we don't have to have a special election and don't incur the costs surrounding that, which are on the order of around $100,000 from what I understand. Um, the uh, on June 1st, there was a, a resolution approved by City Council directing staff to prepare the ballot language. Um, and uh, that was uh, that was the kind of the first introduction to City Council on this uh, this matter. And uh, as part of the discussion on that City Council asked us to present to them some various options um, uh, to as to how the new sidewalk millage would work. So that's one of the things that we're going to be doing in this memo that's going to be going to them in early July. Next slide. Oh. Is the is the presentation still there? I don't see it any. Oh, here it comes. Nick, if you're able to share your screen and pull it up and give that a try, it, it's not um, okay. working well on my end. So uh, you'll have to okay. you'll have to make me a host to do that. Right. Thank you, Nick. Okay, you are now a co-host. You should be able to share that, and we'll see if that works any better on your end. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that now? All right, uh, let me get- It's showing one. in a presentation mode, Nick, with oh, is your it? Okay. notes as well as your- uh, Let me try this again. Okay. Can everybody see this now? <laughs> Yes. Yes. It looks okay. correct this time. Thank you, Nick. Sorry Are you seeing it in presentation mode or just nope. the? Just the slide. So if you hit present, um, it should go to full screen. 
Okay. Hopefully we'll be good to go does, then. Does that look right now? <laughs> it look, looks right. Okay, let me get to where I need to be here. Okay. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna talk about each of these two millages uh, separately here. First, the street bridge and sidewalk millage. Um, as I mentioned before, this is, this is essentially the same millage that was on the ballot in 2016. It's uh, two and one eighth mills. Um, and which relates to, um, which translates to approximately $13.8 million per year. Um, and uh, it will be a five-year millage starting in 2022 um, when the current millage expires. Um, in terms of what it can be used for, um, first of all, there is a, uh, um, what we started doing in 2011 was um, also presenting a resolution to city council with the millage that we started calling the use resolution. And that, go, because we're limited in the amount of words we can put on the ballot, um, this resolution goes into a lot more detail about exactly what the millage can be used for. Um, and, uh, and that is um, basically the main thing is resurfacing reconstruction and capital maintenance, maintenance on our streets and bridges. Um, in addition to that, um, what's spelled out in that document is that the millage can also be used for crosswalks and sidewalk ramps. Um, and as I mentioned in 2011, we added sidewalk repairs to that as well. Um, and finally, um, it, it, as it's written right now, can also be used for non-accessible portions of sidewalk gap projects. Um, but we'll talk about more about that in just a second. Um, as we move on to our, uh, our uh, um, the new, the, what is new coming up uh, this year would be the, what we're calling the new sidewalk millage. Um, and to give a little bit of background first on how uh, new sidewalks are constructed right now under, uh, under the current system, um, those gaps uh, by city code are currently special assessed um, and meaning that the adjacent property owners pay for um, not all, but a majority of the cost of constructing those sidewalks. Um, and thus, uh, these special assessments are currently a major roadblock in getting new sidewalks constructed. Um, they are, you know, a significant uh, financial burden on those adjacent properties. So um, a desire has been expressed to explore a different way to do new sidewalks um, so that they're, um, they're not as much of a burden to the adjacent property owners. And recognizing too that these sidewalks are really for a benefit for the whole community and not only for the adjacent property. Um, so looking at this new millage and what's being proposed, um, it's being proposed as a two tenths mill uh, millage, which translates to approximately 1.3 million per year. Um, it would be, this would actually be a six year millage. And the reason we're doing that is that we would wanna start the millage in 2021 versus 2022 when the other millage would be starting so that we can get those funds sooner and start using them to build sidewalks. Um, and that six year millage would then line uh, the expiration of this up with the other millage, which could be more convenient administratively in the future. Um, so the purpose of this millage would be to either fully or partially replace the special assessments um, to fund the um, sidewalk gap projects going forward. Um, some other details about it, um, this millage, similar to what we did with the sidewalk repairs um, previously, would apply only to taxable parcels. Um, so only sidewalks built adjacent to taxable parcels. Um, and that means that uh, entities like the Ann Arbor Public Schools, uh, University of Michigan, and other non-taxable parcels would still have to pay for new sidewalks themselves, um, usually under separate agreements. Um, and then finally, another note that came up at the June 1st council meeting um, that I wanted to make sure we were clear about, um, the new millage would not replace any obligations by developers to construct sidewalks along with their development. So um, currently when a new development comes in, it's typically required to build sidewalks adjacent to it. Um, this would not change that. The developers would still have to do that. So as I mentioned, City Council asked for some, uh, some options in terms of how uh, this new millage would work. Um, and so we've discussed this a little bit and some of the primary decision points that we see at the moment um, are, are twofold. 
and one is whether the new sidewalk would either partially or fully replace special assessments. Um, there's, uh, um, there's a lot surrounding that in different ways that that could be done. Um, if it were to partially replace special assessments, then it would most likely be done in some form of a cap, um, either on the, a cap on the cost per linear foot of sidewalk or a cap on the total amount that an individual parcel would pay. Um, there's some pluses or minuses behind each version, whether partially or fully replacing. Um, if you have a, uh, if you go with the option of it partially replacing, um, one of the advantages to that would be the the historical equity that that surrounds uh, um, that. Uh, it, it, if you look at it from the perspective of people that have paid sidewalk assessments in the past, um, you know, partially well, having people going forward pay some form of assessment would be some form of historical equity there. Um, the downside of that is that you would still have to go through the lengthy special assessment process and also that, uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, the what we've seen in the past are oftentimes we use federal aid to offset the costs of these special assessments to residents and uh, um, a partial replacement of those assessment costs would still um, require some assessment to neighbors and that could still be a barrier to moving to uh, to some projects moving forward. On the other hand, if we fully replace special assessments with this millage, um, the I guess the downside of that could be the the upside of the other one in terms of the uh, um, the historical equity piece. Um, fully replacing it could be viewed as uh, as inequitable to people that have paid assessments in the past. Uh, but on the other hand, it would take away that uh, that barrier of residents having individual residents having to pay large amounts. The other point um, that we're going to be providing some guidance on to City Council is whether or not the millage should be retroactive to cover any previously approved assessments. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that right now. The attorney's office is looking that, and we're looking at that. We'll provide some guidance on that. Um, and uh, some of the actions taken by city council on Monday to postpone some special assessments might also, um, you know, it might also uh, serve the same purpose. So the next steps uh, that we have going forward on our timeline for this year, as I mentioned, um, a memo is going to be going to city council in early July. Um, explaining some of these various options that we're working on for this new sidewalk millage. Um, and then on July 20th, we will bring resolutions to City Council um, to approve the ballot language on both of these ballot items. Um, and also um, those detailed use resolutions as well will come on July 20th um, to, uh, um, to capture some of that detailed information. August 11th is the deadline to submit the final ballot language to the state. So a decision on the ballot language needs to be made uh, before that time. And then August, August through October, um, we would be focusing on com our communications phase. And that's where we produce a lot of uh, data and information for the public um, to you know, communicate out about the millages, let them know what they're, what they're for, what the purpose is, um, how they would be used and how, in the case of the three bridge and sidewalk millage, they've been used in the past. And then on November 3rd would be election day and we would find out if these millages were approved. So um, with that, I'll uh, happily take uh, any questions. And also I wanted to mention here too, um, if anybody has any additional feedback in the next week or so, um, you know, after you've had time for some of this to sink in, please uh, share that with Kayla um, and she can and she can get it. Um, with that, I think I should probably stop sharing my screen. All right, so I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna be looking in the sidebar for raised hands to take questions. Uh, yes, Commissioner Hadamaki. Thank you. Um, with respect to the new sidewalk millage, when you were talking about pros and cons of the options for either complete or partial um, covering of assessments. Um, could we consider that if, um, for example, say the rule was uh, the millage would go, would cover half of the uh, linear foot of construction for a new sidewalk, could we assume that then something like twice as much 
length of sidewalk gap could be filled with that millage money? Is is that how the ratio would work? Yeah, yeah. With those, with with that, with those numbers, if you assume that the millage would cover half of it per se, then yeah, there would be there would be more money left. I don't know that it would be necessarily be fifty percent more. Um, currently, when we do sidewalk uh, gap projects, the assessments that we do really do not cover the entire cost of the sidewalk. We try to minimize what is assessed. Um, when we, it, oftentimes when we're building sidewalk, we have to do things like building retaining walls. Sometimes there's more extensive grading. Um, we have to do something to accommodate drainage, uh, catch basins, things like that. We don't assess for those things. Um, so it wouldn't be, uh, you know, it wouldn't be 50% means double the amount of sidewalk necessarily. But um, it, you you can see it in some way that, uh, yeah, if, if it was done that way, that there could potentially be more sidewalks built. but Again, on the downside, there would probably be more resistance from adjacent property owners being assessed. Understand. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, yes, Councilmember Griswold. To the left, no. Um, I just wanted to add that in addition to uh, the sidewalks that are being put in by the city this summer, the University of Michigan is putting in a sidewalk on the north side of Baxter from Green Road to Huron Parkway. And that's something that Councilmember Lum and I have advocated for for about a decade, maybe longer than that. Uh, and completely funded by the University of Michigan. And so um, in a regular year, this would be good news, but given that they've canceled all of their construction projects with two exceptions, and this is one of them, I, I think this is really great news and we should be thankful for that. Uh, Commissioner Parsons. <laughs> Uh, so a, a little background, uh, slightly, it's not embarrassing, I suppose, but it, it, uh, a little background for me. I was a sidewalk inspector for the city of Iowa City uh, about 15 years ago before I started grad school. And I walked around with a can of paint and I would measure things and, and have to put down marks for a sidewalk that needed to be replaced. And they called me the kiss of death because they would have to pay for <laughs> improvements. Uh, so I, I want to first say I really appreciate that the city of Ann Arbor uh, is taking such proactive moves to recognize that that sidewalks are transportation networks. We don't really think of it that way usually, but these are pedestrian networks that are that are really key um, transportation networks. Um, to the question, Nick, and, and maybe I can write on this some more about you know do we prorate? Do we uh, do we retroactively? Uh, allow people, you know, some some funds. Um, you know, I, I, maybe some folks in the city can crunch some numbers. When does it make sense? It, it, is paying for staff time going to offset any sort of gains that we make in terms of numbers that we can devote to sidewalks? Um, you know, how do we make it fair? Uh, my leaning is toward, at least for now, roll it out so that it, it can incrementally come to 100% city um, takes over that aspect. Um, I hope that makes sense, uh, but I'll, I'll follow up. Nick. Okay. I, I'm, I'm fine with some retroactive and I'm fine with some uh, homeowner assessment, uh, but I'd like to see, you know, sort of a pattern to, to make it as fair as we can based on previous experience and moving forward. And then ultimately the city can take it over in a way that makes as many people happy as we can. There's always going to be people that are not happy because they got a little bit of a short end, but, uh, as much as we can do that, I appreciate it. So, thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, Commissioner Hadamaki. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for letting me ask another one. Um, the amount that would be or projected to be raised by the new sidewalk millage, how does that compare historically with what's been assessed um, over the last few years? I think it's 1.3 million. Is that more or less or roughly in line um, with what gets assessed um, under the current rules? 
Uh, excellent question. Um, we we actually set that rate based on that information. So it is approximately equivalent of the value of uh, sidewalk projects that have been built annually over the last uh, five or so years. Kayla, are we being asked to come to any action around this this proposed millage change? Uh, I don't think that any action is requested at this time. I believe that, uh, and Nick, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the idea to get feedback um, to be able to, I guess, for staff to consider as they prepare for going back to council. Is that accurate? That is correct, yes. We're looking primarily for feedback on this. We don't actually have uh, final ballot language crafted yet, so there's really nothing for us to ask you to to approve or endorse at this moment. It's more just to collect feedback on the millages that we can include in our communications to city council and that we can incorporate into um, the ballot language and the use resolutions um, that would govern the use of that millage or those millages. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Boland has a question or comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say what I've been thinking about the pros and cons of each side and not coming down firmly one way or the other. So I really like Bradley's option. I don't know if it's feasible, but I'm sort of stepping the percentage up gradually. It feels like that gives people fair warning um, and it might be more palatable than either of the extreme options. I don't see any other hands raised and I should tell you all that my internet is unstable so I can't see any of you right now. I can only see the hands on the side. So if you're raising your hand in real life, I can't tell. Um, but it looks like we don't have any other questions or comments. So I'm gonna say I, thank I you very much to Mr. Hutchinson <laughs> and um, move on to the next item. Um, so now we're gonna invite Nick. transportation engineer Welcome. Cyrus Nahidi to provide an update on how speed limits are set. Hello everyone, uh, uh, good to see some familiar faces and uh, some new ones. Always good to see anyone. Uh, uh, Kayla, I think I, I'm gonna share my screen, right? That's right. Okay, so, so let's see. I have to bring it up. Okay. Can everyone see that? Not quite yet. I think I'm guessing it must still be loading. We're not seeing it quite yet. Give it a moment. How about now? On my end, it, it's still loading. Okay, we're there. Thank you, Cyrus. Yep. Uh, yeah, interesting times. We have to be aware of the different uh, <laughs> technological, uh, you know, cons we're working with. But yeah, as I mentioned, uh, you know, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for your interest in the topic of speed limits. Um, again, good to see familiar faces and new ones. Thank you to everyone, new and old, um, for the time and passion to bring to the commission. And I'm sorry we can't be there together in person. I always knew I'd give a presentation back to commission. I expected it to be in person, but hopefully the Zoom meetings have been a useful alternative. So I'm gonna try and get through my presentation as quickly as I can and try and leave as much time as possible for questions at the end. So I'd like to start with a brief overview of past work. Um, did everyone see it move forward in the slides? Yes, we did. Okay. Yep. Um, just wanted to just Andy check before I barreled full speed ahead, unintended. Uh, so I'd like to start with a brief overview of the past work. Um, you know, many of you are familiar with this, either directly or indirectly. You know, what commission and past and other public bodies have added to the conversation in the past. Um, in 2015, the Pedestrian and Safety Access Task Force 
provided a report of policy recommendations um, covering a variety of topics, but several related to speed limits. And those included a recommending a 25 mile per hour maximum on local roads, recommending a 30 mile per hour maximum on arterials and collectors, working towards citywide speed limits of 25 miles per hour, and lobbying state government for greater local control of speed limits. In 2018, the Transportation Commission built on that work. And this time, as the name of the committee would probably indicate, the recommendations were specific to reducing traffic speeds. The Speed Reduction Committee and subsequently City Council did not recommend um, a citywide 25 mile per hour speed limit for a number of reasons. You know, those are varied in reason, uh, but related to essentially the fact that one size can't quite fit all um, was sort of the thinking. But uh, you know, one thing that's also worth highlighting from that report uh, regarding speed limits and that universal um, language was that uh, the report recognized that uh, changing the number on a speed limit sign by itself is not, um, is not necessarily enough or sufficient to change how comfortable a driver feels driving a certain speed on a street, on a street segment. And that's where a design change uh, does. So, you know, we, we really keep that front in mind uh, as staff uh, as we kind of consider how to go about, you know, changing driver behavior. Um, some other recommendations um, that are of note, uh, below not specific to speed limits, um, amending the traffic calming program, which did occur, um, public expanding and sustaining public outreach, A to B safe, which you're all I'm sure familiar with and has been a successful program. And, um, you know, uh, advocating for a safe systems approach to roadway design, which I'll touch on in a few slides. But, you know, what's also probably no surprise is that recommendations from both reports are feeding into the city's transportation plan update. So I also wanted to spend a moment talking about the need and desire for lower speeds. Um, you're probably all familiar with this graphic at the top left or one similar to it. Um, I think one similar to it was actually in the speed reduction committee report. Um, you know, I think why it's so, why it's shared so widely amongst, uh, you know, those interested in transportation professionally and personally is that it clearly communicates the link between vehicle speed and fatality rate in a crash. It's an effective graphic to explain why traffic speeds need to come down from, you know, from very high numbers. So, um, you know, it's worth noting what I, you know, what I also included here are, you know, some of our policies that are, you know, kind of helping to support that goal. Um, the transportation plan that's in progress and the carbon neutrality plan that's been recently adopted by council are policy documents that support the goal of, you know, of, you know, lower speeds, speed management, because that's a key part of supporting a safe multimodal transportation system. And it, so that's a, thus it's a goal of both A20 and Ann Arbor moving together towards vision zero. And key to doing that is changing driver behaviors. So besides the need, um, you know, I want to focus on the desire because, you know, this is a pretty popular, you know, idea. It enjoys immense public support, especially in Ann Arbor. Uh, two years ago, there was a national citizen survey uh, that touched on a variety of topics and asking 706 Ann Arbor residents um, in one particular question, asking them to weigh the trade-off between drive times and safety for pedestrian, cyclists, and motorists. And the result was you know, overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly supportive. You know, 91% were willing to, or substantial, moderate, or slight support of making that trade-off, you know, supporting increased drive times in order to increase safety. So only 6% are happy with the status quo, and a smaller percentage are, you know, 3% is the top gun crowd who feel the need for speed. Um, they prefer the opposite trade-off, uh, increasing speed. Um, and at the, you know, at the trade-off of, you know, potentially more crashes and injuries. So, you know, at, while this is a, doesn't specifically apply to speed limits, um, it's framed around road design. It's indicative because I think the end result that we're talking about with both ideas is the same. We're, we're trying to achieve lower speeds. So, so we have a need as well as a public desire, and you know, really the question is. How do we get there? And it's a challenge. Um, so as much as I'd like to put this uh, sign up, uh, it's not an FHWA approved sign, just near. 
Um, the current practice, um, speaking briefly to that, is that um, the current practice evaluating and setting speed limits, um, it's worth kind of thinking about the different methods that the Federal Highway Administration outlines regarding this approach. So there's an engineering approach, an expert system approach, and a safe system approach. Um, and engineering approach is probably what you know has been discussed a lot. Um, you know, with a you know primary focus on speeds, either 85th percentile or in some cases 50th. Percentile. An expert system approach sort of applies, you know, expertise and knowledge to um, to you know to the, to the situation to you know sort of build on that. And the safe system approach, um, you know, is really emphasizing taking a holistic look. And, um, you know, we'll touch on that in a, a slide or two, but the best description of current practice in Ann Arbor is that it's partly an engineering approach and partly an expert system approach. So the FHWA methodology, um, known as U, it's known as US limits two. Um, that's sort of the engineering approach and it measures the 85th percentile speed. In some cases, as outlined, um, the 50th percentile speed can be used ability. But from there, relatively minor adjustments are made um, to get to a rounded five mile per hour speed based on other traffic and road conditions. So in Ann Arbor, we kind of consider that a starting point. If you know either of those percentile speeds might result in a higher speed limit, we try to truly address the safety concerns of the segment or what other actions can be taken. So our focus tends to be on what design changes can be made. And as has been discussed uh, you know, in, uh, in, pre in previous presentations and at, or I think from previous work, you know, building on our resurfacing and construction work to really make that happen cost effectively. Because every time we touch a street, we try and evaluate it for, for ways to accomplish reduced speeds. So the proposed design for Plymouth Road is a good example. Um, where the number of vehicle lanes will stay the same, but lanes can be narrowed and buffers can be added to the bicycle lanes. So we expect a commensurate um, change in, in driver behavior, or change in speeds. So uh, staff is transitioning to a safe systems approach. Uh, right now, that is being, you know, I, I would say it's being applied on a project by project basis. Um, so it's really kind of in transition. Um, so as project as each project comes up, we kind of look at it. We try to look at it holistically to determine how to reduce operating speeds, and that's especially true if we know there's a known report reported speeding or safety issue. So expanding on safe systems, um, you know, again, that's a holistic perspective. That you know, in this graphic, there's you know four areas, and the city employs elements addressing these, but there is room for improvement. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on safe vehicles because that's really outside of local control. And uh, you know, A2 Be Safe uh, is again sort of a key initiative that would fall under our right, you know the safe people section here. So the last two sections, you know, safe roads is what I would classify as the engineering design elements that we've been prioritizing in our staff approach. And safe safe speeds, I would you know classify that as effectively safe speed limits setting them safely, ensuring they're being observed and enforcing when they're not. So in a safe systems approach, you know, we, I think where I see our opportunity is to make a clear link between establishing those safe speeds and safe roads actions. So, you know, for, for instance, if we redesign a road, but that section of road by itself wouldn't warrant a speed study and change, you know, once you've redesigned a, enough of once we've done enough construction over enough cycles and we've redesigned enough of a corridor, we might be able to revisit it and change the speed limit because there'd be more than just the signage change to, you know, sort of support the fact that we have different operating speeds. So there's been some discussion about how to reconsider US limits too. Um, and, uh, you know, NACDO, uh, which is a, um, an organization focused on transportation within cities. Um, you know, is com coming up with a, they, they've previewed a methodology, but coming out with more details about it um, in the near future. And um, what's worth noting is that, you know, one of the rubrics in the preview was sort of looking at, for instance, if you had a high activity corridor, and a high conflict density, um, you know, those two parameters might overlap and recommend a 20 mile per hour speed limit. 
Um, so what's worth noting is that, you know, at least in this case, a safe systems approach such as that would be difficult to implement because we don't, can't do that due to state law. So, you know, as I'm sure uh, some of you are aware, we have a state motor vehicle code where local speed limits can't be set below 25 miles per hour. So, you know, outside of changing state legislation, there's not an exemption process. Um, the city, city staff and um, elected officials have worked on and, uh, and provided input into proposed state legislation. So that's drafted, waited, awaiting a committee hearing at the state uh, level. And it's apparent broad bi bipartisan support, but um, no clear indication of when further action might proceed. It also has backing of the state police, uh, State Department of Transportation, and Michigan Municipal League. But again, we we don't really have a crystal ball to tell us when that might um, when that might pass. Uh, regarding state trunk lines, there's uh, you know the, the the access task force and speed reduction committee reports indicate this as well. The state is responsible for setting speed limits on their trunk line roads, you know, roads like Huron, Washington Avenue, and Jackson. And the approach from the state is more of an engineering approach where it's complicated more by the Michigan State Police having a significant role in that process. So there's a significant focus on enforcement more so than the city would typically have. And uh, taking Washington Avenue as an example, um, the speed limit there was set to 45 miles per hour after Michigan State Police took 85th percentile speeds at the off-peak hours. So, you know, again, to us, that might be the starting point. And in that case, it was sort of the end all be all. Um, you know, for us, we would, you know, we there's a there's an acknowledgement that the geometry, the horizontal curves as in that corridor limits sight distance. And, you know, they may not have been seriously considered when determining the speed limit. Uh, the last uh, item regarding state law constraints I wanted to touch on briefly was that there's not ability to do automated enforcement. Um, speed cameras can automatically detect excessive speeds and mail out violations. And they can't currently be installed and used without changes to state legislation. So, you know, unfortunately, that gives police fewer options for enforcement. You know, every enforcement action or potential enforcement action requires a staff police officer for a traffic violation. So in addition to being very expensive, there's other issues um, you know, that that uh, raises. But and you know, one of the trade-offs of enforcement is that a signage change alone puts a, a large burden on, on, on enforcement. Um, if there's not other external factors to precipitate a, design, a, a behavior change, um, it's, you know, we, we can't expect a significant change in behavior um, based on enforcement alone, unless enforcement is, you know, has significant capacity to do that. Um, touching on some recent examples where speed limits were analyzed, um, Washtenaw Avenue, I, I, I went through, so I won't um, touch on again. The next two are city owned roads. Um, you know, for Newport Road, there's a 25 mile per hour speed limit where there was a request to raise speed limits. And uh, again, kind of from the engineering approach, the speed data, you know, could have technically supported that but geometric conditions and sight distance didn't. Um, meanwhile, Getty's, the speed limit was lower to 25 miles per hour. And so I, again, that's kind of where I, I see our approach being a, a combination of engineering and expert systems. If, if we'd been going by a prescribed approach, Newport Road might've had a higher speed limit as a result of this. In the interest of time, I just wanted to touch very briefly on advisory speeds. Um, you know, you can see the sign here. It's um, the you know speed limit on a yellow sign. It's advisory only or recommended speed and not enforceable. And it's generally over a short enough condition, short um, distance that you can't really change the speed limit at you know writ large. Um, it's often used for curves. You know, places where there's either a sight distance issue or the curve and geometry actually affects the comfort of the passenger and driver. There's an actual G-force exerted. And that happens at different road classifications, freeway down to local. So um, in the interest of time, I'll end a sort of blank slate exercise. You know, what, what if we could change speed limits on any road in the city, um, you know, state owned or otherwise? If we were starting from a blank slate, we had the ability to make any change we wanted to produce the transportation network that we are, you know, trying to achieve, you know, what would those changes be? And where would speed limits fall in that discussion? 
you know, what is, well, how would we change driver behavior? Because at its most effective speed management incorporates physical changes to passively get the results you want. So we have the process in place to get us there with vision, you know, our vision zero transportation plan. Um, you know, and the other um, item I just kind of wanted to um, address is that a topic that has been talked about so somewhat separate from the transportation plan among staff and the commission, I believe, is that um, our traffic calming only applies to local streets. And, you know, the, the idea of how to tackle major streets, you know, whether it's actually called traffic calming or some sort of, you know, design, some sort of sort of system systematic design change to our, our major streets, you know, whatever you want to call it, I think is kind of our next big uh, challenge to undertake. Um, it would be a challenge to be compared to our local streets traffic calming program, you know, it'd be significantly more challenging from engineering and design. Trade-offs would be different. The engagement, would, the engagement would be different, but, you know, it's kind of on us, you know, staff, commission, uh, council, the public, there's that need, there's that desire for, for lower speeds. So, you know, it's incumbent upon us to try and figure out how to make that happen. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for the time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Great, thank you so much. Sorry about my disappearance earlier. Um, let's see here. So I'm looking for hands. Yes, um, Commissioner Felt. Uh, so we have a subcommittee now for the uh, 7th Street to look at what sort of what went on there and what's going on. And I, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this question exactly. Um, but I think the question is, on a street like 7th, how do you get the speed limits lowered? Not only the signage, but also in practicality, if you have people who are exceeding the speed limit by 10, 15, 20, and more miles per hour on a somewhat regular basis, um, what, what do we do? Are there really streets in Ann Arbor where we cannot get cars to stop speeding? Um, is, there really, is it really true that we can't get cars there to slow down? Um. No, it's a, it's a good question. Um, just, uh, just, okay. I, sorry, I just messing with my control. I want to make sure I, right That's now okay. I stopped sharing, but um, if I need to bring it back up, I, I suppose I can. Um, no, I, I think um, you raise a good point. I, I don't think the, I don't think the answer is necessarily that we can't change the speed limits. I think, right. The answer is that we can't change the speeds. The question is just how do we change the speeds? And I think speed limits alone, speed limit signs alone um, are not the most effective way to get the job done. You know, I understand. I, so, um, so, you know, I think that with the 7th Street Committee uh, or 7th Street, you know, sort of public engagement that's happening, I think everyone's aware that the design changes that have occurred there are, you know, more of an interim basis. Um, and so when they undergo a more full scale redesign, you know, there's the opportunity to you know, to really make design changes that uh, that better reinforce those speeds. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, although I'm then thinking, is that five years away? Is that 10 years away? <laughs> um, um, that's a good question. I don't know. How is I, that process initiated? Because um, it's already been over five years that the, that the neighbors have been asking for help i unfortunately i can't speak to timeline um yeah right and cyrus maybe i can chime in for just a minute um the, the city will be updating its capital improvement program um this coming fiscal year so there is always an opportunity for us to reevaluate uh which projects are funded in which years obviously you know the pie is fixed in terms of how much funding is available but um that's oftentimes when the city goes through and um, you know looks at what are the, the priorities and, and which should move forward. So, so there's an opportunity to have that conversation in the not too distant future. 
Um, okay, so I've got Commissioner Parsons, and then we'll do Council Member Griswold, and then Commissioner Boland. Cool. Uh, Cyrus, thank you. That was great. That was great. Good to see you, man. Uh, thank you, too. Uh, some of my questions or comments, I, I think, are just going to have to be like legal questions that I sort of put on record because you can't answer them. I already know. I can't either. Um, but but the other is coming back to 7th Street. Um, this expert uh, setting of speed limits like on Newport, it seems like this might be a place where we could also on 7th sp specifically based on who is there uh, in the roadways decide it's 25th and then design 25 sorry and then design for 25 miles an hour it's you know it's this chicken eggy thing do we go with 85th percentile or do we design uh for what we want and if we decide we want 25 miles an hour on 7th um then you know that's a possibility um and uh, you know what i'm curious about and this is where it gets into the legal aspect and and sort of over our heads i think um according to the municipal code uh 257 627f any highway segment with 60 or more access points for vehicles in a half a mile has to be 25 miles an hour. Um, and the response from staff previously has been that that's for rural roads, it's not for in, in city roads, but seventh uh, qualifies with all the, the uh, all the, the driveways, the entryways, the uh, side streets, um, so is it possible that we could use the state code to actually force us to go 25 miles an hour as a legal 25 mile an hour speed limit and then design around such instead of being dictated by this 30 mile an hour uh, thing? The other thing, though, I do want to say is that I, I super appreciate that you guys are going for the exemption for under 25 for neighborhood streets. Uh, please push that forward. That is really important. Um, to a lot of folks, including a lot of neighborhood folks. Um, so I, I fully endorse it and, and appreciate the efforts and I'm enthused right now to hear that you guys are pushing that forward. Yeah, uh, thank you for the questions. I'll, I'll answer the second one first, just because you know, there's, it's, there's not a lot more to say on it, but yeah, as I mentioned, um, you know, it's been championed by, you know, by various uh, parties of the city and other local you know, municipalities in Michigan. Um, you know, I, I think it might be just one of those things that's not at the top of the state government's um, priority list. So it's possible that it passes sort of in a slower period or lame duck period or what have you. But again, we don't really have a crystal ball. Um, we've done what we've done what we can do from a technical perspective. I think at this point, it comes down to sort of lobbying and, you know, trying to make the case in the public sphere. Um, so, um but we're we agree i i agree we certainly look forward to you know having more flexibility um if that uh if that passes so the um the question about seventh um you know I, and i appreciate that you asked this in advance because otherwise i could never have told you what that specific part of the <laughs> vehicle code is i don't have it memorized or anywhere close to it um you know we did um we I think what's um, important to note on Seventh Street is that there, we, you know, the, the densest portion of the corridor is um, between Liberty and Washington, and you know, near Waterworks Park, we actually, I believe, do have a lower speed limit of 25 miles per hour. Yep. And um, you know, what's unfortunate, and you know, again, sort of gets to what I mentioned, is that, you know, in that Seventh Street study, um, we're not seeing significant differences um, based on that signage change alone. I mean, we, we, uh, we put in some other design um, considerations to try and help augment that, but that section of 7th Street doesn't, um, yeah. you know, doesn't, doesn't see a significant speed difference from the other parts. Uh, you know, I, I, didn't have, I, didn't, I didn't have a chance to actually see how much of 7th falls into this um, exact threshold. Um, it's, it, is, it is kind of a weird, it's a, it's a weird um, metric because it wasn't it wasn't really developed by engineers. <laughs> um, yeah. it, do, it doesn't mean that you know it, there's something to be said that density and using that type of threshold is a useful yeah. rubric, but um, you know the exact numbers and 
using those specifically and you know maybe at the expense of considering other factors is we've been trying to as staff we've tried not to rely on that language as it's written because it is to your point i think it is, it's written with a sort of wide swath of context in mind so yeah that is just super quick follow-up um yeah. you know because because the mission michigan vehicle code prohibits so much of what we can do i'm interested in where the little gaps are where we can insert ourselves and this might be one um I, th I think everybody agrees that they want slower speeds on on seventh other than a couple people that try to pass through it so they can get where they're really going out to dexter or to downtown or whatever uh, but but the folks who live on that street certainly want slower speeds you know as a cyclist i want slower speeds um and if if the letter of the law which usually hurts efforts to lower speeds might actually help um i'm okay with staff pursuing it if if that it seems viable and, and folks want to do it um, and then we can always design around that you know city you know the, the state mandates that this has to be a 25 mile an hour road okay so we have to design for it that's that's a lot more palatable to a lot of other people than saying that oh yeah you know that the city has decided that this is going to be a, a slow moving corridor or something um, you know there's a lot of kids that cross seventh there's a ton of cyclists that cross seventh We've got a whole bunch of advisory bike lanes. Like this is a, this is a, a one of those where an expert uh, speed system uh, might say 25 miles an hour already, but even if we go letter of the law, we might be able to say 25 anyway, and then we can build for it. And I don't mean build like putting concrete. I mean there's all sorts of tactics that we can use to slow stuff down. And and those those mid block uh, bollocks, for instance, at crosswalks do amazing things. Um, so I I just like to see us pursue it and and I'm enthused that you guys are open to it, Cyrus, and and I really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that. Um, you know, the only thing I can say is you know, like I kind of ended the the presentation with, um, you could almost consider Seventh Street, you know, a you know, a crack at a major street's traffic calming program, right? Um, so I think if you look at it that way. We have things we can learn from it, um, things we can, you know, both positively and negatively and, you know, and you, I don't know about neutral, but there's, there's things we can learn from it, you know, uh, in all sort of facets. And I agree. I think there's, there's an opportunity for us to use seventh street as, you know, a way to, you know, both, you know, to Linda Diane's question, um, you know, figure out how to actually, you know, do a full, a, a more full redesign, but also, you know, to try and, learn some of what we applied there towards other, you know, other streets citywide. All right, thanks. So we have uh, Council Member Griswold and then it will be Commissioner Boland. Welcome, Cyrus. Um, I have a question about 7th Street. The state law prohibit us from using traffic calming such as speed humps on that street? I I actually don't know if state law specifically prohibits that. Um, I do know it is not our practice to do that. Um, Cynthia or Raymond, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the state law and can speak better to that. Yeah, I'm not too certain about the state law aspect. Um, you know, as I, I know almost everybody on this meeting knows Seventh Street is fairly complicated because it is classified as an arterial in our system. And so typically it, it, would, it would be fairly atypical um, in Ann Arbor and, and, and I can't even really think of other examples where you have a um, speed hump on, a, on an arterial. Um, that may not be entirely, you know, maybe there are a couple examples out there, but it would definitely be the exception. Um, I, I know, uh, I, I think Marty's also on the call not to ask put her on the spot for this one, but I know there's sometimes limitations on um, arterials, uh, or at least what we can use um, gas tax funding on. Um, maybe that that's not as relevant here, but that's the only thing that I can think of related to like a state law um, and how we would um, retrofit an arterial in that way. 
Okay. Well, the residents truly view it as a residential street, regardless of what the category is. And so that's, that's one of the things that's troubling. And then do we have any data on volume of traffic on 7th? Because I'm thinking that with the road diet on stadium and now with um, the changes on 1st Street, is that going to, and the construction there right now, is that going to further increase the uh, the traffic on on 7th? Um, the, any any date, data on that? You know, I, I think the 7th Street study is a fairly complete data set. I th we might have more recent um, traffic data than that, but it does a pretty, you know, the, the stadium road diet would have been in place since then. First Street, to your point, would not have yeah. been. Um, you know, that's obviously a pretty, you know, specific moment in time right now with First Street's construction. Um, but yeah, I would say that that um, Seventh Street study is probably the best, um, the best source to sort of think through all those issues comprehensively um, from a both professional standpoint and you know public standpoint. Sure. Oh, okay. Um, and I want to raise the issue of the school crosswalk that's on Washtenaw near Tappan, sort of the back of it. I mean, we, we know that speed kills. We know we need to reduce speed. And and the crosswalk that's there just seems um, insufficient for a 45 mile an hour. And is that crosswalk design mandated by the state or could we have a more robust crosswalk there? Does anyone know? Because um, if I, I don't know, I, I know the design there. I don't know um, that that's it's. A, sorry, I'm just in the interest of time, since that's such a specific question. Maybe we could address um, questions at that level of specificity over email, just so that we're already at eight thirty, and it'd be great to keep moving through our the rest of our agenda. Oh sure, okay. Yeah, Thanks. we'd be happy to. Yeah, that's. To your uh, point, Commissioner Kleiman, please, any any follow-ups you have that you either think of and we don't have a chance to answer now or that come to you later, please, please let us know via email. Great, thank you. And um, Commissioner Boland, I know you've been waiting. To ask oh, sorry. Um, so, Cyrus, thanks for this presentation. And I just wanted to follow up on the major redesign um, thing that in order to really change speeds on 7th or maybe other roads too, we have to do a major redesign. Are you talking about like a like an expensive construction project, there are not inexpensive ways to change? Um, no, when I say, I mean, when I use the word major, I meant major streets. Um, the major does not necessarily have to apply to the scale and cost of, um, of the redesign. Uh, Seventh Street is probably a good example in that it, you know, it, you know, it went through a, you know, short, still relatively you know, significant redesign um, for the short term basis. Um, and, you know, so I think, you know, again, like what I what I had mentioned um, in prior questioning, I in some ways, I think Seventh Street's a, a template and not to say we would follow it exactly. But, you know, we have a pretty um, process for how we handle traffic calming for local streets. And you know, 7th Street is the most recent, you know, really latest and greatest example we have of trying to, you know, really handle, you know, do design changes and change driver behavior on a major street. Um, uh, so that's, I guess that's when I, when I, when I describe what we're thinking about doing, I would say 7th Street is maybe a, scratching the surface of what we could maybe do for other major streets. Does that answer your question? Well, not really. So what I thought, and this sort of uh, ties into what Linda Diane was asking about time frame. You know, when you say major redesign, it sounds like something that's further out in the future. And I, I just wondered, um, you know, are, are there no um, quick fixes in our toolkit that would be easy and inexpensive to implement. So I don't know the seventh street situation, you know, in, I don't know every, you know, short term, medium term and long term recommendation there, but I would say that the short term fixes are the, 
ones that have been tried, the ones that are in there. And I think we've seen some some changes um, in behavior and driver behavior and in you know in uh, the you know sort of the, the use of that. Um, is it the scale we want to see? You know, no, we, we 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 think we can do more. But again, that's that was sort of that's that that was sort of I think the the point of the short term, medium term, long term recommendations of that study. So. I mean, things like stop signs have come up in some of our discussions. Is that a sort of? So stop signs are a very different uh, animal. Um, you know, that's um, it's an inter it's a it's an intersection control device. Um, it's not a it's not a way to slow speed. It's not a way to calm traffic. Um, and there's a pr there's a very you know, dictated federal uh, engineering standard to follow there. Uh, similar to, you know, how much volume goes through an intersection before you want to consider a traffic signal. We have similar, but albeit lower standards for a stop sign. Um, and the issue with putting in a stop sign that doesn't meet those warrants um, can be significant liability because it can cause driver confusion as people start to see a stop sign they don't have to obey because there's only an issue two hours of the day and the other 22 hours are apt for an accident, you know, for a crash to wait, waiting to happen. So that makes sense. So, all right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nahidi. That was a great, that was very helpful. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're going to, we're going to move on to our next agenda item. If there are other questions that people have, please, um, we'll follow up by email. Um, so now we're going to invite transportation engineer Cynthia Redinger to provide an update on crosswalks and lighting. Good evening, everyone. Um, in the interest of time, I will try to get through this presentation really quickly. It is pretty short to begin with. Uh, this evening, we are specifically trying to um, answer the question of is it better to not have a crosswalk than to have a crosswalk without illumination? And this is a question that we received from the Transportation Commission, so we are responding to that this evening. And there are some really important considerations when we try to answer this question. And they can kind of break down into four categories. When are people walking? When are our crashes actually happening? What is the data telling us and how do we best serve all pedestrians? And answering that first question, when are people walking? This graph that is shown on the slide, it, it's a generic, this is what traffic volumes throughout the day look like. And in general, all of our corridors tend to follow patterns that are close to this. You see more traffic volume during the day, you have some peaking in the morning, you have peaking in the afternoon, you have your most significant peaking during that evening commute home. And does that hold true also for non-motorized travel? Generally, yes. Our critical hours for data collection um, as listed here are 7.45 to 9.15, 11.45 to 1.15, and 5 to 6.30. And then we take that data and we extrapolate it out for daily um, what our daily volumes are. So when are our crashes happening? And this scatter plot shows um, all of the pedestrian crashes that occurred between 2000, the years 2014 through 2018. And those are plotted against the, the day of the year and the hour of the day and the 24 hour clock. You can also see on here the hour of sunrise plotted and the hour of sunset plotted. So you can see where pedestrian crashes are falling, whether they're falling inside daylight hours, outside daylight hours, or in those dusk and dawn periods. To so look at that by the numbers, 2% of our, cra our pedestrian crashes are occurring during dawn, 53 during daylight, 2% during dusk hours and 42% during dark hours. Of those dark recorded crashes, 37% um, are recorded as having lighting conditions and 5% are unlighted conditions. And then 1% of the 
crash reports came back as having unknown lighting conditions where it just wasn't filled out properly. What does that mean for our serious injury crashes? So when we break that down, we can see that in that same time frame, our serious injury crashes, which are our fatal crashes and our A-level injury crashes or incapacitating injury crashes, they're following a fairly similar pattern. Looking at that by the numbers, 6% um, of our crashes are happening at dawn. So 6% of our serious injury crashes happen during dawn where lighting conditions are really challenging. 31% of those crashes happen during daylight hours. We didn't have any reported during dusk for this data set. And 63% of our crashes are occurred during dark hours. 56% of those crashes being with lighted conditions and 6% being with unlighted conditions. And just a little note on that nomenclature. I know that lighted and unlighted are kind of unusual terms, but that is specifically the way that Michigan's crash report reads. So that's why I'm, I'm reporting it in those terms. And then also 1% of the crashes were unknown. So what does the data tell us? We've got a significant portion of our pedestrian crashes, but 46% that are occurring outside of daylight hours. And that's significant because you expect the majority of your crashes to be occurring during um, the hours of the day where you have the most exposure. So those are the hours of the day where you have the most conflicts that are occurring. So the highest volumes of pedestrians and of vehicular traffic. 49% uh, of those dark crashes involve a hazardous action by, by the driver. So that is really interesting because that means that nearly 50% of those crashes um, have a behavior component to them um, that's based on driver behavior that is something that we can be looking at. And another thing that's really interesting is looking at those, those dark crashes and what does that What's that injury profile actually look like? And so of our dark crashes, 1% of them are fatalities, 15% of them are incapacitating injuries, 40% are non-incapacitating injuries, 23% uh, are what's called possible injuries, so more minor injuries, some bruising, maybe a little bit of a laceration, and you know, there's some abrasions. And then 21% are recorded as being property damage only. So how do we best serve all the pedestrians? And we need to continue to implement proven safety countermeasures. Um, these are examples from crosswalk visibility enhancements by the FHWA STEPS program. And STEP stands for Safe Transportation for Every Pedestrian. Hot examples are high visibility crosswalk marking, um, parking restrictions on crosswalk approaches, so making sure that you have clear visibility of uh, the sidewalk ramps and, and where pedestrians are going to be approaching their crosswalk. Overhead lighting, advanced stop for pedestrian signs and stop lines, uh, such as we use for our, our multi-thread approach locations. In-street pedestrian crossing signs, something that we use throughout the city. Curb extensions, also known as bump outs, also something that we use uh, in a lot of places around the city. Um, raised crosswalks, this is a device that we are currently using this in the city, but it is restricted to use in um, coincidence with our traffic calming program. Pedestrian refuge islands, pedestrian hybrid beacons. Uh, these were formerly called hawks. Uh, this is the type of device that is at Chapin and Huron currently. Road diets, also something that we've used throughout the city. And rectangular rapid flashing beacons, or RRFBs. So if these are the things that we need to be doing, how do we keep doing this and serving everyone? We need to continue with our crosswalk evaluation cycles that we're currently going through and implementing our crosswalk design guidelines. 
which are really based on those same best practices that we went through previously. And continue with our street lighting evaluation cycles and continue to implement prioritized lighting to provide positive contrast lighting on major streets and to provide those major street crossings with you know the the lighting levels that we expect them to have so ultimately is it better to leave an uncontrolled crosswalk unmarked unless it's unlighted and I guess what, what I'd like to say on that is that illumination is one tool in the engineering toolbox. And it is an important tool that complements without replacing the other tools. Now, research has little to say on this exact question because lighting is considered a complement to other tools in that engineering toolbox. And of course, this presentation has really focused on the engineering components of safety. And also other features such as high visibility pavement markings and signs. Uh, they work during the daylight hours and our dark hours. And lighting only improves conditions during the, the dark hours. Um, we as staff have, um, we really think that lighting is important, that it's important to include in our designs. But part of this question, what we really want, um, the Transportation Commission to take away from that is that um, it, it's best a story told with an example. So I think North Maple is a great example. We implemented a road diet on North Maple and that gave us the opportunity to, you know, really look at some opportunities for providing non-motorized access across that corridor. And we were hoping to be able to get some islands, pedestrian refuge islands in as part of that project and where the desire lines, where the community showed us their desire lines were didn't necessarily line up with the ability to get the, those islands implemented. So what we instead, you know, were able to do was to put in the high visibility crosswalks to give them the our RFBs and to be able to facilitate those crossings. Now, in that particular example, we had some really strong desire lines that were associated with transit stops. And we had known locations where we had a lot of people crossing the road. And we were able to get, um, you know, get those pavement workings and get those RFBs in and start serving those populations as soon as our construction was done. And unfortunately, in that location, the lights out there are not under city control. They are DTE lights. So in that scenario, we are beholden to their schedule. And we installed those crosswalks last year and some of those locations were still, you know, struggling with DTE to get the last of the lighting installed. But I think it's important to acknowledge that although perfect was not in place since last year, those people who were already crossing the street have a better condition to be crossing in. Um, so that's where I will stop. And I will go ahead and uh, take questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking for raised hands in the sidebar. I'm not actually seeing any. Great. Um, so then I will just say thank you very much for this presentation. It was really, it, this was a question that I've been wondering about um, as well for a while. So this was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks so much. Um, we're going to move right along. This is great. Um, oh, now we're, so now we're moving into business. Uh, and we're going to invite Transportation Manager Raymond Hess to provide an update on the Healthy Streets Program.
All right, let me know, please, when you have my presentation showing. I see it. You can see okay, everything. very good. And is it full screen? I'm kind okay. of sharing a screen. Okay, good. All right, it's so. Full uh, screen. It's not okay. full screen, so um, you may want to go to file, full screen. Or I guess maybe it's view. Mm -hmm. so yep, good. I want to do is share with you a presentation that we gave to um, city council on Monday night. Um, actually, what I want to do, hold on just a moment. I'm going to drag my notes here. All right, we should be good to go now. So um, yes, we presented to city council um, uh, a series of two resolutions uh, related to the Healthy Streets Initiative. Uh, and what I'd like to do is walk you through that presentation. Again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna to try to get through as quickly as possible. Um, my apologies for that, but this was a pretty packed agenda. So let's just jump right into it. So one of the first things we wanna mention is that, you know, the, the COVID uh, pandemic has really um, kind of focus this need on uh, how streets are being used and what are some of the demands that are currently out there. Uh, and specifically, there's an increased demand for walking and biking. Um, there's increased pressure on curbside space. There's commercial activity impacts. There's transit service impacts. Uh, but then conversely, traffic volumes are down among motor vehicles. Um, and so city council uh, responded to this and addressed it with the a resolution to promote safe social distancing outdoors in Ann Arbor and specifically requested staff to implement a residential street closure program as well as identify opportunities to use non-residential streets to expand safe social distancing for pedestrians and cyclists based on best practice, work on other cities and data. Um, and that's ultimately what this uh, presentation is meant to kind of give an overview of what some methodology was that went into that. Um, one of the first things that we did is we really wanted to look to some of the best practices um, and you heard Cyrus mention the National Association of City Transportation Officials or NACTO. Um, they've really taken kind of a front and center approach. Uh, many communities are, are looking to their guidance in terms of what are some things that can be done. Uh, and a lot of these are, as you can see in the graphic, kind of these um, easily implementable quick response type uh, almost tactical urbanism style approaches where, you know, they do not necessarily require infrastructure changes, but can be done with, you know, cones and barrels and things of that nature. And so what's interesting about the um, national guidance from NACTO is there's um, several different um, kind of levels of response. And it depends on whether stay at home order is in place, whether it's before the Vaccine is, is issued, but um, we're now allowed to you know, no longer shelter in place. Um, and then once a vaccine is in place and post COVID-19. Uh, 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 and so where we're currently transitioning to right now is kind of that second row where, you know, obviously the stay at home orders are being lifted. Um, hopefully they stay lifted. Hopefully our, we keep our numbers down. Um, but we don't have a vaccine in place yet. So there's still a need for uh, social distancing. Uh, and there's this need for really allowing bicyclists and pedestrians to make sure that they can kind of um, pass each other safely and, and use the public rights of way in a way that uh, really uh, kind of addresses the, the need out there in the community. Uh, we looked closely at what other uh, communities are doing. And again, there's a lot of good uh, examples out there. There's a lot of uh, good dialogue and discussions about what we're seeing across the country. Um, I'm currently working with Transportation for America on a curb space management program and some of the communities uh, really have transitioned that discussion to what they're doing amid COVID-19. So Bellevue, Washington, Gainesville, Florida, Boulder, Colorado, uh, just to name a few, I think there are about 20 different communities that are part of that conversation. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of information exchange through those venues. So now what I'd like to do is just quickly talk to some of the street selection process. And this really speaks to how the data was used and really um, what analysis went into selecting the streets that were ultimately selected. So 
So the first thing is we looked at data related to efforts that were currently underway. We checked payment conditions and lighting, um, and each recommended location has uh, the intersection lighting that would be expected uh, for um, kind of our, our typical design for um, a major road. Um, one thing to note is we're not making any new crossings, um, and quite frankly, there's no major infrastructure change proposed as, any, uh, as part of any of these um, pilots. Um, so we're not doing physical construction. There's no new lighting going in as part of these specific pilots. Uh, it's really about what can be done with uh, kind of a quick deployment. Uh, the one exception, though, would be, you know, if pavement condition is in pretty poor condition and it's something that could be patched by Public Works, uh, we would put that on their radar to make sure that they could go out and look at that information uh, and help that along. Uh, we also looked pretty closely at crash data. Um, and so on this map, you can see in the downtown example uh, that Catherine, Division, and State uh, kind of jump off the map a little bit, which are some of the suggested streets uh, for this consideration. Um, and then this is specifically looking at pedestrian and bicycle crashes resulting in injury or fatality. And again, you still see similar hotspots uh, as part of this analysis. We also looked at crash data uh, from a citywide perspective as well, uh, making sure that, you know, again, when we look at these different pilots, we look at them holistically, how well they tie into the downtown street closures that were proposed by the merchant associations, and how the DDA proposal can tie into um, other city uh, closures beyond um, uh, the downtown area. Equity factor was another thing we wanted to make sure we looked at, um, really looking at the data in terms of where there are transportation equity needs. This is a map that you could find in our mobility fact book. Um, and it's really showing kind of these red arrows of how we could get people into town. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that we really looked at when we try to figure out how we could serve um, you know, minority populations, unemployed uh, populations, vehicle or households without vehicles, so forth and so on. Level of bicycle traffic stress is another thing that was looked at. Um, we really wanted to kind of have an understanding of what uh, the experience is for cyclists. So, you know, I think many of you are familiar with this idea that, you know, just striping a bike lane in and of itself may not lead to a very comfortable facility. So what are really the opportunities to kind of fill gaps where there may even be a bicycle facility, but it may not actually fill the need for many people trying to use those facilities. So zooming in, uh, this is the downtown area. The, the pink highlights some of those kind of uh, areas of, of you know, bicycles traffic stress that uh, really could uh, benefit from filling in and making those connections throughout town. And all of that led to selecting some of the, the base locations. Uh, you can see the red circles kind of represent where, when looking at all this data, where some opportunities emerge. Uh, so you can see kind of, um, uh, Catherine, you can see Division, you can see South Main, you can see um, State and North U. Uh, and ultimately, that's what led to the suggestions that were put forward um, as part of the DDA proposal. So the first is the Miller Catherine Bikeway. Uh, the second is Division Street. Third is South Main Street, which is just a small connection between the existing William Street um, bicycle facility, the new one, uh, and Packard. And then um, a small section connecting that same facility on William um, on State Street to North U and linking it over uh, to kind of the campus on the north side of the quad, or I'm sorry, the diag. And so just to quickly give you an idea of kind of what the before and after treatments can look like, um, there, this is an example block of Catherine uh, where there could be a cycle track um, initiated as part of that project. Um, and so what we can do is kind of step through those really quickly. So um, specifically looking at Miller and Catherine, this is kind of the existing condition where you have um, a bike lane already existing, uh, vehicular travel lanes, but kind of this intermittent um, second vehicular travel lane. And that could be repurposed to a um, protected bicycle cycle track, uh, similar to what you have on William Street. Um, division going north, again, many of you are probably aware that there is an existing bike lane, but again, it's not a very comfortable bike lane because uh, it has, you know, 
fast moving vehicles um, and it's, it's a lot of vehicles and it's a lot of um, uh, lanes to travel. Um, and so because volume, traffic volumes are down, there is an opportunity to kind of repurpose that outside lane and again, create a bi-directional bike lane uh, cycle track sort of concept. Um, on North, oh, I'm sorry, on South Main Street between William and Packard, again, there's an opportunity to create that uh, missing link there uh, between those two facilities. Um, I'm sure you're aware that when you're heading north on Main, there's kind of that right turn lane, that, or I'm sorry, that, that outside lane turns into a right turn lane. Um, and so there's an opportunity there to repurpose that and create buffered bike lanes or actually protected bike lanes uh, heading in each direction. Packard, uh, there's a missing gap in the sidewalk network. Uh, for those of you that have biked down Packard, it's very uncomfortable between the section of Hill and State. Um, and so there's an opportunity there to fill in that uh, section of the, of the network. Uh, and so this is what that configuration would look like. Um, the other thing that I'll note here too is, you know, I keep mentioning kind of cyclists and, and network gaps for the cycling infrastructure, but um, these facilities could also serve the needs for pedestrians as well, right? So, um, you know, people need to step off the, the sidewalk in order to socially distance. Um, so it's, it's really meant for kind of both users. Um, the other thing that I should note, and one of the things that really um, precipitated a lot of this is we looked at traffic data as early uh, or as late as last week, and traffic volumes were still down about 50%. And so this really represents the opportunity that, um, you know, there's an opportunity for capitalizing on both the need for better bicycle pedestrian facilities, as well as the fact that traffic volumes among vehicles is down significantly. Um, and then the last one for the DDA is the State Street to North U. Um, this is not so much creating a new um, bicycle pedestrian facility, but it's really about working with the merchants and repurposing some of the on-street parking uh, to allow for some of that commercial activity that you're already seeing in downtown. Um, again, obviously this creates a better um, pedestrian environment um, and it can free up some of the sidewalk space that might've been used for outdoor dining to create um, and move that to the, the parking bays. So for the city lane closures, it would, uh, what we were proposing is kind of an extension of what building off of the, the DEA. Um, and so the map that you see before you, uh, the green dashed lines show what I just reviewed from the DDA closures, but then the red lines show the existing bicycle network. And you can see how the blue lines can help fill in some of those bicycle network needs. Um, so the first one is the Broadway Bridge. Uh, when COVID first hit, we heard a lot um, from people who were saying, that it's impossible to socially distance on the bridge. Um, a lot of bicyclists and pedestrians use this bridge alike. And so if you took the North Division proposal from DDA and kind of extended it across the bridge, you could have a configuration similar to what was described before, where you would have a cycle track sort of operation with a bi-directional bike lane on the south side of the street there. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to remove the outside lane for pedestrians on opposite that. Um, this one would probably, you know, we could look at this to see if this one would be needed or not and how well this is serving the needs for those um, people using that facility. Um, south Main Street, uh, again, taking what was proposed as part of the DDA and extending it south to Stadium. Uh, again, it really represents this opportunity that since traffic volumes are down, you could repurpose that outside lane um, in each direction and allow for uh, bicycling uh, and walking and social distancing. Uh, Packard Street on the eastern kind, this is east of Eisenhower. Uh, again, this is a, a fairly wide road. It's a five lane cross section, two lanes in each direction with a center turn lane. Uh, traffic volumes are, so, are down so significantly that um, you could reduce it to one lane in each direction with a center turn lane and have no um, significant impact to the traffic. Um, and this, this connection was important because Packard is a fairly heavily used uh, bicycle facility. Um, and Platt is as well, but this is kind of a missing link in that network. So then in summary, uh, again, you can see that uh, for the DDA, you know, again, Division, Miller, Catherine, State, North U, South Main, and that section of Packard. And then for the city, um, building off of the Division for Broadway, South Main, and then East Packard way over um, past Eisenhower. 
And so just to give you a, um, an idea of what was being proposed on Monday night, there was, um, first of all, this was being proposed for a 90 day pilot. Um, their data collection was, is, is part of the process. We wanna make sure we have good baseline data before and that we're monitoring the situation throughout um, any of these um, proposals uh, if they do get approved. And so it is something we wanna make sure that um, you know, we have a good understanding that uh, we're not adversely impacting anyone and that it's really serving the purpose that it was meant to serve. Um, um, so during the 90 day pilot period, you know, we would constantly check for effectiveness, um, other issues, usage, benefits and impact. Uh, you see in the middle column there, the different data that's considered uh, for collection, including traffic volumes and speeds, um, uh, crash reports and, and public feedback. Um, and then ultimately this all feeds into kind of that decision-making process. Um, anything that would, uh, you know, if the pilots are successful um, and there's still a need for them beyond the 90 days, it would be something that we would have to go back to council for, um, that they would automatically expire on the 90 day um, uh, trial period. And then just to end on a slide with, you know, that I showed earlier, but really highlighting where we are, um, you know, in that national guidance that we talked about um, before there is this vaccine, the really, the need that still exists today, even though the economy is opening back up, is the need for separated bike lanes, for vehicle speed management, um, for sidewalk expansion, uh, and to really kind of expand some of those active transportation opportunities for those who uh, both are seeking it out and quite frankly might not have other means, especially in light of some of the impacts to you know, transit and, and um, people's other forms of mobility. And that is my last slide and I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Raymond. Uh, I'm gonna keep an eye on the sidebar for our raised hands. Oh, Madam Chair, I did want to mention, um, so on Monday night, we presented this to City Council. City Council postponed action on it until uh, July 6th, I believe, is their next meeting. Um, so what that does afford you the opportunity to do is if you do wish to make a recommendation um, on this, um, it is something that we could share with um, uh, City Council. Um, obviously, we didn't know exactly how this was going to play out, but since it is something that's already posted on your agenda, I talked it over with Kayla. It seems like that wouldn't violate any protocol since it was on the posted agenda already. Right, I knew we were gonna to wanna to hear an update on the healthy streets regardless. So um, this was really helpful. Um, it looks like we have a couple of hands. So I'm gonna start with Commissioner Hall. Yeah, I was just wondering, I saw like some of these projects were going to add pedestrian space and some added just bike lanes and some added pedestrian space only on one side and then a bike lane on the other. And I guess I'm kind of wondering, it seemed like pedestrian space wasn't added on a lot of, in a lot of spots. And I'm just wondering what led your decision process versus whether they were gonna add bike versus pedestrian space or whether they might actually have kind of a shared use type path that's like, this is for pedestrians and bikes or. Yeah, Commissioner Hall, thank you for that question. It's, it's really the latter um, that you mentioned, kind of the shared use sort of situation, because you know, if you think about what a lane width might be, um, 10, 11 feet or uh, thereabouts, uh, that is fairly uh, consistent with what's recommended for a shared use facility uh, by AASHTO design guidelines and others. So um, it could serve in that function for a shared space. And, and ultimately what we're really trying to do is, you know, like I mentioned before, a lot of these areas already have an existing sidewalk, but it may only be a four foot, five foot, six foot sidewalk, which is not adequate to really share with uh, other pedestrians and or cyclists and pedestrians. So um, really kind of doubling that space up uh, really gives kind of that opportunity for people to uh, white walk or bike uh, in, the, in those spaces. Um, some of the signage that we're seeing uh, in other communities is a sort of shared use symbol, uh, almost like a trail crossing that shows a bicyclist and a pedestrian. Um, uh, that's sort of the sort of signage that could be deployed as part of um, these pilots. Uh, okay, Commissioner Boland and then Council Member Griswold and then Commissioner Hadamaki. Yeah, um, I found these designs really exciting. I, I, I love them and I'm anxious to see them um, put into practice. 
Um, one question I had was, are there bus stops along these uh, routes where you're instituting changes and, and will that be, hand, how will that be handled? Yeah, that is something that we've, um, Amber and I have talked about quite a bit. Um, so like South Main Street, for example, has bus stops along it, um, Packard does. Um, so it, it would definitely be something we would have to, to think through. Um, one of the things that uh, the DDA uh, was talking about is, you know, is there a way we can get uh, creative with a, a sort of bus stop design, um, especially making sure it's still accessible. Um, and so um, my understanding is the DDA shared um, the information with um, the AAATA um, and, you know, we haven't ironed out those exact details in terms of how we can best accommodate the ride, but it's definitely something that um, is front and center in our consideration, making sure that we don't want to, you know, make something better for some and worse for others. Um, and so, so yeah, no, but thanks for bringing that up. Council Member Griswold. Um, I wanted to mention while this was postponed until July 6th, um, I learned today that there is going to be another council meeting as early as next week. Um, we're going to get an update on the Gelman plume. And so um, if the details were available for some of these projects, they could be considered earlier than July 6th. And I did have one question is um, I didn't see Yost Street. On the presentation, did I just miss? No, council member. Um, so there, there are several different pieces <laughs> as part of this Health yeah. Streets initiative. So, um, so but, but no, you bring up a good question. So, um, you know, I, I like to think of things in kind of like four different flavors. The, the first flavor are the downtown street closures that are fairly mm -hmm. intermittent that were done as part of the uh, Downtown Merchants Association. So. Some of you may have gone down this past weekend and seen that you could, you know, walk Main Street and walk um, uh, sections of Washington and, and, and other places. Um, so that was kind of the, the first flavor. Then um, the second flavor are the two, second and third of the two I just described, were the proposals from the DDA um, and the city about how to build off of those downtown merchant closures. Um, and then the last one is the neighborhood, what we're calling the neighborhood slow streets, which is really just a subcategory of the Healthy Streets program, but specific to neighborhoods. Um, and this is the one, um, you know, where we are monitoring the sort of public input that we're getting, um, seeing which recommendations are coming from people who live along that street, and that's specific to Yoast. So there are 18 locations um, that uh, are being suggested as part of that, um, Yoast being one of them. Okay, so Yost is considered a neighborhood street and we're going forward with the local traffic only, is that correct? Correct, yeah, so that, that okay. is, uh, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's classified as a local uh, and so therefore we could implement that neighborhood slow streets program. Okay, thank you. Great, um, great. Commissioner Hadamaki and then Commissioner Parsons. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I first want to give my... Uh, uh, full endorsement of all these concepts. I'm, I'm really excited about all of them and thank you for bringing them forward. Um, and uh, you kind of addressed this um, in your um, discussion with Council Member Griswold just now, but I wanted to, to point out, make sure everyone understood that the, the residential street closures are kind of a, um, I mean, they're all under the auspices of healthy streets, but they're a separate program. They're not part of the discussion we've had here and um, the residential streets are also not part of um, what were considered at council Monday night. So um, I, I know that um, um, council members are, are looking for more details on, or, or, you know, engineering drawings, for example. Um, but uh, there were some comments made by members that, um, that questioned um, in the, neighborhood street closures like you're showing here for example sunset i think was mentioned and, and maybe yost and and um i just want to make sure that you know next time this does go to council whether it's monday or july 6th that that council members understand this isn't um about the neighborhoods it's just about what you've shown in the slides here because i, I just worry that maybe some council members wanted to delay because they wanted to discuss all of these neighborhood closings 
and uh, which, as you said, are, are already planned and, and going forward. And being someone who lives on, on Brooklyn, um, one of the streets affected, uh, um, by the way, I just wanna say I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up that question. I, I did wanna um, note a couple of things. The, the neighborhood slow streets are what I would call a soft closure. So as opposed to what I just showed, which would be kind of hard lane closures with cones and vehicles would be prohibited from kind of moving into those spaces. The neighborhood slow streets is really kind of an advisory sort of treatment that would uh, the purpose is to you know, cut down on cut through traffic, um, slow speeds down, and really alert motorists to the possible presence of bicyclists and pedestrians, maybe even in the roadway or, in, or just an increase in bicyclists and pedestrians um, through those neighborhoods. So um, pursuant to the council resolution, um, city council directed uh, the city administrator to, to implement those as soon as possible. And so We've been kind of refining that process. I think when we reported to you last month on that, we told you about the sort of one third threshold of support. Uh, you told us that was too high. We've since modified that. Um, uh, and then we are allowing for a sort of opt out clause as well, pursuant to some direction we got from some council members that, you know, if those people who live along that street hate it, um, they can contact us and we'll take it out if we have 20% or more people that uh, oppose it. So. So we're really just trying, and so the other thing that I wanna note with that is um, uh, we're putting informational signage out in advance of the deployment. So then people know that it's coming, they understand what it is, and if they have concerns they wanna raise, they can do that before the deployment happens. But thank you for bringing that up, so that I can clarify that. Commissioner Parsons and then Commissioner Felt. Uh, Raymond, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, it was, uh, it was great. It was uh, comprehensive. Um, I'm, I'm a little surprised Yoast keeps coming up. It came up Monday night. It came up tonight. Um, this seems like a perfect example of a street that should be a neighborhood street and not a throughway street. That said, um, I'm, I'm to the point where I think that we might need to have a committee or a commission to, from the Transportation Commission to look into why this took so long to develop. Um, from what I understand, staff has been looking at this since March. Uh, major cities have already enacted it as of April 11th. Uh, we had Raymond Hess put together a memo as of April 14th on directions forward and all the actions that we needed to take. And here we are, we're gonna be looking at three months. Uh, COVID is still here, but man, the, the major impacts we're missing. We're, we're so slow to act and I don't understand why. I really don't understand why. Uh, so I, I just wanna put that on the table that I don't understand why why council decided to postpone uh, on the the agenda items on Monday, uh, and I don't understand why we are so slow to act at times when it comes to really important infrastructure changes that truly could be safe, much safer for everybody involved. Thanks, Commissioner Felt. Um, just a quick reminder that if you mix wheelchairs and also strollers into this, um, I've had a number of anecdotal reports from friends and wheelchair users in particular who have had to back up because they've been approached on sidewalks and places where people have basically refused to give them space. Um, and uh, they can't they have to stay on the sidewalk. <laughs> they don't have the option of, you know, stepping into the grass or whatever. Um, so as, as we do design this, we need to design with uh, those users in mind as well. That's it. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I am just gonna say one of, a couple of my thoughts really quickly, and then I'm gonna propose a resolution that we encourage council to approve these changes. Um, I just, it, it seems to me like it really demonstrates the values of the current city council that they moved very quickly to open streets for businesses, but have un, been unwilling to make adjustments for people. Uh, and I, I'm concerned by those priorities. So I would love to see the commission put forward a resolution um, that city council approve these changes as presented. I don't think we need additional renderings um, and that we do so as soon as possible. Um, Kayla, or actually Linda Diane, you're my parliamentarian, right? Can you help me figure out how we put, 
how do we how do we put a I've never put a resolution forward on the fly. What am I doing? You're doing fine. Okay, great. So that's my proposed resolution. Um, I think I get a motion and then we do discussion, right? Um, so can I get so uh, Commissioner Parsons and a yep. second for Commissioner Hadamaki? And now we're going to have discussion. Do we want to talk about this resolution at all? Uh, yes, uh, Council Member Griswold. Um, yeah, I just want to add that while it did look like we were focused on businesses, at the same time, we authorized staff to start with all residential streets without further discussion from council. So staff's been totally authorized to do that. Yes, and I'm very excited about the residential streets as well. Uh, I also yeah. live in a neighborhood that's gonna get slowed down and I'm, I'm thrilled about it. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of cut through traffic. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Parsons, uh, Parsons, is that a hand? Yeah. Yeah, two things. One is that it's my understanding that even the neighborhoods, uh, city movements have been held up behind the scenes, um, that it's not as smooth as just making it happen through staff, that city council members are having difficulty with it. But I don't know, That's that might be hearsay, I'll admit. Hmm. Uh, what I will say is that the sooner that we can approve this and let the city get to work to let staff get to work with what they can do. They have all these skills. I think we need to set them free as soon as possible. And I wish it was months ago that we'd agreed to this. Um, so I will fully support a resolution from the Transportation Commission to say, please approve as soon as possible for the city to enact these to the best of their ability. Thank you. Any other comments? Is there any other part of that, Kayla, that needs to say, and we will send this to city council or we'll direct city council or any of that language need to be added? Uh, I, I think that we're good. It's a recommendation okay. from the Transportation Commission to city council that um, the items proposed in the pilot programs proposed in the presentation that Raymond delivered, that okay. those be approved as soon as possible. That's what I understand the resolution. Great. I think that I think that's great. So can I get? Oh, go ahead. No, good. Um, so can I get a motion for that, Parsons? And can I get a second? I'll second. Um, Commissioner nope. Felt. So all those in favor, we're gonna um, physically raise our hands. I'm going to. I'm going to. Okay. And all those opposed, I'm gonna ask you to physically raise your hand. Okay, so it looks like, oh, and abstentions. Okay, so motion carries. Was it unanimous? I didn't see any. Uh, yeah, pretty sure it was unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, great. So, zipping along staff report. Um, Raymond, I think what we decided to do for this week, because of the very full agenda, you, you sent out... Molly? Project updates? Yes, Kayla. We have one more item before we get to that. Oh, did I miss one? Oh, sorry. Good. Yes, um, I see it. So now we're going to invite Council Member Griswold to provide an update on Chapter 40, Tree and Vegetation Ordinance, which was referred from City Council to the Transportation Commission and the Commission on Disability Issues. Uh, yes, Council Member Hainer brought this forward and proposed changing the 12 inch height of vegetation in some areas to 18 inches. My proposal is that we don't need a height uh, maximum at all and that this ordinance should focus on safety, primarily pedestrian safety and uh, language in there regarding different types of blooms and vegetation really are redundant. This, this should be about sight distance and safety and nothing else. Um, so is there an action that you're asking for from the Transportation Commission? Um, well, given the time of night. I, I don't think so unless someone wants to support a resolution that that we address chapter 40 based on safety and not based on vegetation types. I would um, support that. I, I would be interested to understand how safety would be measured and how property owners would be able to identify whether or not they're in compliance and also if they're 
are any standards around visibility, vegetation height, I think all of that would be really useful before we put forward a recommendation of one kind or another. Maybe this is something we can ask to put on the agenda for next month. Is that, would that be amenable? That would be, that would be fine. And there are, um, not OSHA, but uh, maybe uh, Cynthia or Raymond can, there is um, a transportation professional, it's called the Green Book, that actually specifies what site distance should be at intersections as well as on the lawn extension. Uh, and one of my concerns right now, and it's mentioned in the safe social distancing outdoor resolution, is to ensure that vegetation is maintained so that it's not creating a site distance problem or blocking pedestrian travel or the bike lane. And as you saw from Cyrus's photo where he had the little curved uh, road sign with 20 miles an hour, the vegetation was at least a foot, if not 18 inches out into the roadway and that negatively impacts cyclists more than, than uh, vehicle drivers. Um, great, so let's, uh, let's figure out how to have this on the agenda for next time so we can get um, the relevant information and then see if we wanna put mm -hmm. something forward to council. Okay. Um, so thank okay, you. Thank you. In, in determining next steps for this, I think if uh, commissioners have questions pertaining to the draft ordinance revision that we've been asked by council to consider, if there are questions, they should uh, submit those to me and then I can um, work with the appropriate staff to get responses or be prepared to discuss this at the July commission meeting. Does that sound like it'll yeah. work? I think that sounds great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Brett, uh, Commissioner Hadamaki, I see that you have your hand up. Is that just left over? Um, not really. I, I just wanted to point out that, that the proposed resolution that was passed to us only adjusts the 12 to 18 inch in the city right of way. It actually didn't touch the uh, private property, but that might be moot if we want to look at the entire um, chapter, chapter 40. And if, if we're getting into the discussion of, of, you know, kind of rewriting or rethinking that chapter, especially from a, a safety perspective or a disability perspective, um, is that something we can do in a meeting like this or does that require like a subcommittee or um, who's going to author proposed uh, a, a new chapter to our ordinance? I think what we would do is start with an informational item on the agenda, get, gather the information that we need, and then that will help us determine if we need to have a committee or if there's, if there's something that we can move forward on um, in the moment. Um, so I think that's, that's what I would suggest we do. Uh, okay, great. So then I think we're ready to move on. All oh, right, to staff report and updates. And I believe that for in the interest of time, correct me if I'm wrong, Raymond, we have all of this in our packet. We can review it at our leisure. If we have questions, we can ask Raymond by email. Um, yep. Is that, we good? Yeah, yep, that's perfectly fine. Okay, great. Um, so next we move on to liaison reports. So any commissioners who specifically serve as liaison to another body or organization are invited to provide reports and updates. Um, Commissioner Hall. Yeah, so the Commission on Disability Issues met today and there were some things discussed about uh, the uh, AAATA. I mean, I know someone brought up the uh, A-Ride previous provider was uh, not renewed and that triple ATA would be taking this in-house. We also, there was some mentioning, I mean, this is something I brought up, but uh, yeah, the triple ATA service cutbacks during COVID and that now they're working on their restoration plan. And we were kind of wondering about that. I mean, it might be useful if we could get triple ATA to kind of uh, maybe do a presentation on this at the like next meeting or something to so we know what the plan is for restoration because I was actually a little concerned because they came out with their plan and the first phase of restoring service, the only thing it did is add shuttles to the park and ride lots while not doing anything uh, beyond the reduced schedule for the stay at home order uh, for like the normal routes. And uh, which means that a lot of routes end at 7 p.m. seven days a week. 
even though things are starting to reopen. And yeah, I mean, I might take this as more of my personal concern, but I had brought it up and at the Commission on Disability Issues, and it would be nice to hear more from AAATA about what's going on. I mean, obviously I get they want to stay safe, there's reduced demand, but at some point, yeah, there's going to be increased demand, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Let's, so we'll, we can add that to, to the list for agenda items um, going forward. Um, were there other yeah, things? I don't know if the triple ATA re liaison might want to chime in at all, or yeah, if they're still on, but yeah, I know it would be good to have a more detailed presentation because, yeah. Okay, thanks. Other liaison reports? Okay, um, so now we're going to move on to commission member communications. So uh, at this point, all commissioners are invited to um, provide reports and updates. Uh, uh, yes, Council Member Griswold. Um, I'd like to request an agenda item for our July meeting. Is that appropriate now, or should that's, I wait? That's, that's next. Next, it's next on the okay, list. Okay, I'll wait. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Smith. Uh, sorry, this is uh, Brian Smith. I'm not prepared tonight to talk about plans for service restoration, um, but would be happy to have that added as an agenda item. I believe July uh, would be able to do something uh, for the commission in July. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Parson. Um, I'm going to have an agenda item to add as well, so, but, but this is just communication. Um, a, a friend of mine who happens to own one of the major shops in town said that bicycles are currently the new toilet paper, uh, and they are completely overwhelmed. And so I think that we can just keep that in mind as we're thinking about everything that we're doing right now, uh, that we're going to see a lot more active tra transportation uh, as we move forward, based on Thank sales you. anyway. Um, so I just wanted to share that bit of info. That, that I was uh, shared. Thanks. Okay, seeing no more commission member communications, let's get, move on to the call for agenda items. And I just want to remind you all that um, at this point, we're not going to get into a detailed discussion of any of the agenda items. This is a chance to bring forward the topic, and then we can flesh it out as we're discussing uh, the agenda later in the month. Um, so, Council Member Griswold, I know that you had one. Um, yeah, I'd like to have a discussion about crash data. The 2019 data is available as as well as the uh, crash data for the first six months to see what the impact of the pandemic has been. Okay. Um, Commissioner Parsons. Okay, I'm going to try not to do a big long speech, <laughs> but I'm going to jump in with the traffic uh, data that uh, Council Member Griswold just talked about. Um, we really need to look beyond the aggregate. Uh, daytime crashes in 2019 were up for pedestrians, the highest in a decade. Um, we need to look beyond the aggregate of what, and we need to go to who, how, and why, and then what we can do about it. Um, so I would, I would love to have a comprehensive uh, look at that, the crash data that includes some geotagging and some analysis. But that's not the major thing that I'm, I'm hoping for on the next agenda or on a very future agenda. Um, I, I think that this commission uh, could use uh, a, a lengthy discussion about what experimental treatments or depends what you call them, Sam Schwartz um, calls them interim treatments. Other people call them pilot treatments. That there is, uh, a belief for some in this community that these are not standard, that these are substandard, that these are, are dangerous. That's not true. That is, this, is, this is cutting edge stuff that people are doing and it's normal practice. Um, I, I just want to point out that Stacy Meekins, uh, who's with Sam Schwartz, a Vision Zero expert back in February, um, called these post and paint treatments. That's how familiar, familiar they are with them. They can be quickly implemented they cost very little, they are safe, and they are best practice. And so I think that we need to be on the same page when it comes to installing temporary measures that is gonna improve the safety uh, of the 
the environment. The other thing to say is that, um, because there's a lot of talk of engineers often, that Stacy Meekin said that engineers like these programs because while the, what they anticipate on paper doesn't always play out. And so they like to be able to see interim temporary installations installed uh, so that they can make real world tweaks before we put it in concrete. So I would really like to see uh, probably somebody besides staff, because I don't know if some members trust staff at this point. I would like to see someone who's a vision zero expert explain what experimental pilot temporary measures mean when it comes to the transportation environment. Okay, thank you. Are there any other agenda items from folks? I have one that I would like to add. Um, so I think it was last year we we worked through a big six E's exercise as a commission. Um, the six E's of is it engineering? I don't actually know what they're the six E's of. I think energy engineering is one of the E's. Um, yeah, the, um, Raymond, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's typically um, you know it's used by the Safe Routes to School. It's used by um, the League of American Bicyclists for really evaluating kind of a holistic bicycle and pedestrian environment. Okay, so um, it's it it's that specific. That's help. That's helpful. Yeah. So then, what I wanted to bring forward is that um, the Safe Routes to School network recently removed enforcement from their six E's um, and they've replaced it with engagement. And I would love for us to talk about what that might look like um, for the city of Ann Arbor as well. Um, I think we probably won't have time for that next month, but um, I think it'd be great to have a chance to do that sometime in the near future. Um, okay, so we've gone through agenda items. The next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, um, was there someone else? No. Okay. Wednesday, July 15th, 2020 at 7 p.m. This is also going to be a virtual meeting and Zoom details will be provided in the future. Um, so if there are no objections, we're going to adjourn our June 17th, 2020 meeting. Thanks, Molly. Okay, great. We are adjourned. Seeing, seeing no objections, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks so much.